Um, thank you for joining me on this webinar today. Um, my name is Alexander Ma. I'm the New York City Admissions Counselor for Binghamton University. And uh, for the students that have recently been admitted, um, congratulations. So this year we, re we received something like 40,000 applications. So it's a really big accomplishment um, for you to be admitted. Um, so first, we're going to introduce the team that's joining us in the webinar today. I'm um, starting with the admission staff. So, Michaela. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Michaela Ridley. I'm one of our admissions counselors. I work primarily, I really work with students all over the country, um, but some of my big territories are Ohio, the greater Washington, D.C. area, and my own home state of Washington. Byron. Hi folks, my name is Byron Gittins. I am a senior staff member in the admissions office here at Binghamton University. I am from Queens, New York, and I am based now in Connecticut. Uh, the territory I have is Florida. I'm a bummer, right? Um, I also um, am watching over New England, uh, but a big shout out and congratulations to those students who were admitted and for any other students that are out there thinking about Binghamton. Cool, and David? And hello everyone, my name is David Babb. I am the New Jersey Regional Admission Officer and I also recruit students in the state of Georgia. Um, congratulations on your acceptance. Cool, and then moving on we're going to do the pre-health advisor starting with Dr. Langhorn. Yes, uh, I'm Thomas Langhorn, I'm the Director of Pre-Health Services here at Binghamton University. And then Karen? I'm Karen Cummings. I'm an academic advisor in Harper Advising. And who's that guest with you? This is Riley Cummings. She's my <laughs> And then, uh, Evan. Hi, my name is Evan Mills. I am a academic advisor and pre-health advisor in Harper Academic Advising, along with Karen. Cool. And then next, moving on to our tour guides, uh, Kayla. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kayla. I am a senior. I'm going to finish my, finish my integrative neuroscience um, degree in just like two weeks from now. Um, also pre-med. Um, yeah, and I've been a tour guide for about three years. Ben? Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a senior from Staten Island, New York, uh, and I study integrative neuroscience on the pre-health uh, track, and in the fall, I'm going to a DO school. Josh? Hi everyone, my name is uh, Josh Normando. Um, I am a senior as well, majoring in biology, minoring in health and wellness studies. Um, I am a pre-optometry student. I'll be entering optometry school in the fall. And I have been a tour guide um, for the past four years at Binghamton, so yeah. Awesome, Matt? Hey everyone, I'm Matt. I'm also a senior at Binghamton, a biology major, and I will be going to MD school in the fall. And last but not least, Andrew? Hey everybody, my name is Andrew. Um, so I, I'm a senior as well. Uh, I'm from Scarsdale, New York, and I'm pre-physician assistant. I'm in the application process. Um, that'll begin very shortly. Thank you. Um, and also in the background, then you'll hear introductions from them later, are the peer advisors from the pre-health program, um, Leah and Andrea. Um, so several weeks ago, um, I did have a webinar on Harper College. So Harper College is the biggest um, college with the Binghamton. So I think about 60 or 70% our students actually graduate within Harper College at Binghamton and um, what's housed there is a lot of different uh, fields they can go into anywhere from the languages, the sciences, um, interdisciplinary fields, and the humanities. Um, also listed under, under Harper College is our advising track. So today we are focusing on pre-health and I will turn it over to my colleagues in the pre-health department to um, speak about uh, what their specialty. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about various of options within pre-health. Um, Dr. Langhorn is here, myself, Karen Cummings, and Evan Mills is with me as well. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the different pre-health professions, who can be considered a pre-health student, how can our pre-health advising services help students. We'll also talk about campus opportunities and early assurance programs. Stop. Okay, so, so just a little bit about us. Um, the advisors that you see on the screen, there are five of us currently. We work with freshmen and sophomore um, pre-health advising team. Um, our job is to work with freshmen from the time they come in at orientation um, to the time that they're there and then kind of going forward. Um, we also have seven pre-health advisors as well, pre-health peer advisors. 
Um, they are current students um, and their job is to work with students along the way to help them get prepared as well. Um, they are students who are going through the same process as our current students. So there are a wealth of information for our students in terms of classes to take, how to take them, um, and things like that. So we'll work with them their freshman year and sophomore year, and then junior year we turn them over to Dr. Langhorn. Um, Dr. Langhorn has been working with juniors and seniors for over 35 years. Um, he is a phenomenal person, phenomenal mentor. Um, he's involved in many, many um, well-known organizations, national organizations. He's also an adjunct anthropology um, professor as well. And so we want to talk also a little bit about who is pre-health and who could be considered a pre-health student. Health is an umbrella term that we use to describe students who want to gain entry to a graduate health program after they earn their bachelor's degree. So a lot of schools may have a pre-med or perhaps even a pre-health major. Um, pre-health is not a major at Binghamton. It's really a track that you would decide on based upon your interest in the health field. Um, it's nice because it offers a lot of flexibility. The prerequisite coursework for a lot of these fields is very similar, whether you're interested in pharmacy, medicine, dentistry, veterinary science. Um, a lot of that undergraduate coursework is similar, so you can switch fields if you decide you want to do something different at the graduate level. Um, and it's, um, rather than having a dedicated major, you can, um, it, it offers you a little bit more flexibility for anybody who might be interested in a health field. So how can pre-health advising help you? So our job at Binghamton is to guide you and to support you. Um, you're going to work closely again with our students, with Dr. Langhorn, um, with our alumni, um, and we're going to work you through, obviously, from classes, through the application process, figuring out if it's the right thing, right process for you, right pathway for you or not. Um, but we go from start to finish, orientation through graduation and beyond. Um, we're very close with our alumni, as you'll hear me say as we go along today. Um, they come back, they visit, they help us out. Um, so you're always going to be a part of the pre-health family. Um, in terms of degree planning, it is individualized. Um, academics and pre-professional advising. Um, so we really kind of run the gamut in terms of what we do. Uh, we talk about required courses, we look at GPA, uh, your undergraduate degree, what is it going to be in? Is it going to be in science or something else? Because as we said before, you don't have to major in a science. We look at community involvement, letters of recommendation. Um, we work with you in terms of research, internships, volunteer work, clubs and organizations. Um, and then we look at the process you're going through, the admissions exams you're going to be taking. So we follow along in the holistic review that the schools and your um, graduate programs are going to be doing as well. As we know, it's not just about the GPA, it's not just about the coursework, it's about a holistic review. What are you bringing to the table in terms of academics, your character, your admissions exams, co-curriculars, and we're going to walk you through all of that as advisors, not just classes you're going to be taking, but what do you need to achieve your goals and how are we going to help you with every piece of that. One thing that we are proud to say is that um, for BU, for pre-health, we don't pre-screen our pre-health students. So some schools require a minimum GPA in order to be pre-health. We don't do this, so we will work with you with any student who comes in and wants to be pre-health. Um, it's also a very individualized program, so it's no one set path for anyone. I have students who are majoring in science. I have students who are majoring in graphic design. I have some students who want to take summer classes and try to go abroad. I have other ones who just want to get their classes done. And everyone's path is going to be different, and that's okay. We're going to tailor our advising to what you're bringing to the table and what your needs are. Um, and again, you know, with our holistic review, we really feel that from everything that we're doing, we're going to get you where you want to go. So we offer a lot of pre-health related events and workshops. Every spring we have um, a accepted students panel. There's pre-health research panels and mixers. There's physician um, alumni lecture series. Um, so those couldn't think, in the past those have included things like you know, a day in the life of a trauma surgeon, a day in the life of a gastroenterologist, a day in the life of a primary care physician. 
Um, we offer a, a lot of credentialing support as well um, as you're getting ready to apply to medical schools. We have a very nice summer physician mentor program where you can actually go and shadow a physician for the summer and see what their work might be like. Um, those are most often Binghamton alumni and there's a wide variety of different types of physicians that you might be able to shadow and, and just see what their work is like. We do our best to keep you informed about scholarships, research that you could do, different internships that you could do. Um, of course, the alumni speaker events I've mentioned, um, and we do our best as well to connect you with mentors um, who might be able to help your interest in the health field. Um, if you have questions about the different pre-health curriculums that you might want to choose based upon your, your interest in graduate school, there's curriculum guides on our pre-health website, information about scholarships, research, research that you could do, internships, um, and lots of contact information for us, for Dr. Langhorn. Um, we operate a, or we maintain a freshman and sophomore pre-health handbook that you can take a look at as well. That's updated every June uh, with new information from the different schools that you might be interested in. So we do offer quite a few different opportunities on campus as well, not just through Harper Advising, but through our um, other colleagues in different offices, such as the Feichman Center for Career and Professional Development. Um, we work closely with them in terms of their health science internships. They also offer a graduate school fair as well every year. Uh, we also work with Harper Edge, where they have what's called the LACE program. It's a liberal arts to career externship program, and you can actually um, shadow different alums in various fields as well. Um, we offer cam the campus research opportunity postings, though we also, you know, it's important to get research if there's different fields of medicine you want to go into or different kinds of graduate programs you want to get into. Um, so there are quite a few different research opportunities with BU faculty um, starting as early as your, as your freshman year here. Um, we also offer summer research and internship opportunities as well. Um, so it's never too early to start one of them or look into an internship or a shadowing program. Um, it's going to round out your resume um, and potentially, you know, be one of those pieces of the holistic review that schools are looking for. BU also offers early assurance programs as well. There's quite a few different ones depending on what your path is going to be. Um, so if you're interested in those, you can definitely ask us about those too. I think we transition now to uh, Dr. Langhorn to speak more about uh, pre-health data. Okay, so I guess this is my cue. The first shot you saw was um, a group of our alumni on at their white coat ceremony, which is something that happens the first day of medical school. Uh, and these folks, they had a, an additional alumnus took this picture and emailed it back to us. This is uh, from the our graduating class of 2012 from Binghamton. So all these folks have long since graduated medical school and moved on. But um, uh, it was such a nice shot. We always put it in the slides here. But that's where everybody hopes to be when they graduate from here um, is in one profession or another at the white coat ceremony. So we have um, our admissions data is always uh, from the prior admissions year because the current year is still in progress. So for 2019 for medical school, we had 156 applicants, um, 99 of which were accepted. Um, that gives us a composite acceptance rate of 63% compared to the national rate of about 41%. And these are our most common target schools, if you will. Um, Buffalo, Downstate, Upstate, NYIT, Albert Einstein, New York Medical College, and Toro. And last year, um, we did get an, uh, a student into Harvard. Um, dental school, we had 37 applicants, uh, 31 of which were accepted uh, for an 84% acceptance rate, which is quite a bit higher than national. And the more common um, schools were um, uh, at Buffalo, Stony Brook, um, and um, Columbia, Toronto, and NYU. And the next 
is our optometry. Uh, this is a little unusual. We always have a, a smaller group of, of students applying to optometry school, but we rarely hit 100%, uh, which we did last year. There were nine applicants. Um, all nine were accepted. And the three regional schools, um, SUNY Optometry, Salus in Philadelphia and New England in Boston were the destination uh, for them. Uh, we have, as was mentioned earlier, we have an active peer advising program here. Uh, we have from six to nine students who are um, part of the peer advising program every year. Uh, this is the cohort that was um, present for most of this year, uh, supporting the um, student body. And today we have uh, two of them, Andrea Price and Leah Goldberg, the two seniors, who are going to well, introduce themselves and give you a brief um, history of, of you know, who they are, what they're doing next year, and what they've done while they're here at Binghamton. Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Price and I am currently a senior integrative neuroscience major from Syracuse, New York. I am a pre-health peer advisor and I have been accepted into Upstate Medical University under their early assurance program. And I will be attending Upstate's College of Medicine starting this August. Throughout college, I have actively played the French horn in Binghamton University's Symphony Orchestra. I've also shadowed various um, doctors and physicians and worked as a pharmacy technician, a research assistant, and volunteered at Upstate Medical University as well. I also participated in Binghamton's Neuroscience FRI program, conducting research um, for my first three semesters of college. Hi everyone, my name is Leah Goldberg and I am a senior biology major from Westchester, New York. I am on the pre-med track and I will be attending medical school uh, this coming August. Uh, some of the things I've been involved in so far at Binghamton have been pre-health advising. Uh, I also was a part of the freshman research immersion program and I worked in a bacterial biofilms lab and then I continued with research for the rest of my career at Binghamton. Uh, I also participated in one of the internship programs through the school where I was able to shadow multiple physicians uh, at the Robert Packer Hospital in Sarah, Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, so the uh, first questions I wanna ask actually to the peer advisors, um, why'd you pick Binghamton? I, I actually picked Binghamton because I was interested all along in upstate's early assurance program, as well as I was from the Syracuse area, so I was nearby. And my third reason, I guess, would be the freshman research immersion program that I was invited into. And I just fell in love with the campus when I stepped foot on it. I picked Binghamton for a lot of similar reasons. I'm also from New York, uh, a little bit further away though, uh, but many of the reasons I picked it were just the variety of opportunities available. Uh, I looked at the variety of shadowing opportunities in the area and the internship that I was actually a part of. I researched before I came to Binghamton. Uh, I also uh, liked the FRI program so I could be involved in research. So I just felt there were a lot of opportunities available for undergraduates, which was really important for me. Oh, great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna go into the Q&A now for some live questions and answers. And the first one is for the um, uh, pre-health advisors. Um, can you actually talk a little bit more about what early assurance is and the requirements um, to be accepted that, to that kind of program? Um, I can walk through a little bit of that. Uh, so for the early assurance program, it we have a specific program to Upstate Medical University for pre-medical students, and you would start applying second semester of your sophomore year once you are at Binghamton University. And I would recommend going online to Upstate Medical's uh, website and Googling their early assurance program and seeing their minimum requirements that you must meet before you apply. It requires a minimum SAT or ACT score, and as well as certain courses that you have to have completed in once you're at Binghamton before the end of your sophomore year, such as your intro chem and your intro bio courses. And we have various resources on campus that you can use once you're here for help with advising, including other pre-health peer advisors. Cool, 
Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I know there are some things that we haven't touched on in the uh, presentation itself. Um, so I am getting a few questions about uh, pre-veterinary programs and uh, what's the acceptance rate and, you know, typically how many students from uh, being to apply to, pre -vet, uh, to veterinary schools. Okay. Um, that's one of our smaller interest areas. And with veterinary medicine, there's also a lot of um, alumni that apply. In other words, there, there are people that, that might take a year or two off after graduation to gain additional animal experience. Uh, and um, sometimes it's hard to track those people once they, once they uh, graduate, even though they haven't applied to veterinary school yet. So in a, in a given year, we'll probably have um, five or six uh, current students applying. We may have an equal number of alumni applying, but that's, that's a very fluid situation. Um, and typically, uh, at least 50% will get in. Sometimes it's more in given years. Um, then, uh, and usually Cornell is the most common school that, that admits them, though they, they tend to gain admission um, in, in other schools across the region. And occasionally we've had um, a student attend uh, veterinary school in the United Kingdom, for example, um, and also occasionally in the Caribbean. Great, thank you. Um, so this question is about internships and shadowing um, different medical professionals. Um, so what percentage of students actually get internships at Binghamton? And do we have any kind of like um, partner hospitals um, in the city of Binghamton or down in New York City or elsewhere? Well, the local area internships are run through the Fleischmann Center, and they have um, arrangements with all three of the local hospitals. Um, so um, I know that it appears that most students that, that want to get internships will get them. Um, the internship programs are only one semester in length, so they will roll over and there'll be a new set of students will get an internship the following semester. They give you academic credit as well as the exposure, um, but the, the local ones are all run through the Fleischmann Center. So I, the mechanics of that, I'm, you know, I'm not really well versed in. Um, the other program we have is the, the Summer Physician Mentor Program that was also was mentioned earlier. That is run through a, it's spearheaded by the, um, Harper Edge and it's run th through the Harper Dean's office and that will typically have about 15 or 16 placements each summer um, and you can do it either your sophomore summer or your junior summer. Um, that's, um, that's the other program we have. Um, the program that that Leah mentioned that she did, that is a special program for students in the Binghamton Scholars Program. Uh, and so that not, that's not open to everyone, that's just open to students in the Scholars Program. Um, so the next question is actually back to early assurance and some more um, details behind the program. Um, so one of the attendees asked um, if the one of the requirements is to be accepted into early assurance program, is to have higher than a 1360 on the SAT. Um, if I do not have a 1360, am I able to retake it um, to get it above that? Um, usually you can't retake the SAT for the upstate early assurance. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, there, there might be some flexibility in that. That's, that's really a question you've got to ask them. You do, have to take the MCAT if you are uh, accepted in early assurance. So they do have another metric to measure you with. But um, the require, as Andrea mentioned, the requirements are all itemized on their website. We have the uh, parallel listing requirements um, itemized on our website. Uh, and uh, also uh, they will accept alternately, they'll accept the ACT and not, not the SAT and you get to pick. You, you know, if you took both tests, and one is uh, higher than the other one uh, on a relative scale, you can simply submit the higher one. You don't, you don't, if you took them both, you don't have to submit them both. You can pick which one you want to send. 
Um, and then you would have to engage in a discussion with them about, um, you know, where the threshold is and, and um, you know, what they might do with your application. And, and to follow up with that, do, um, do you know what the uh, admissions requirements for the early assurance program with um, SUNY Upstate? Well, that would be, um, you need a, that score is 1360 um, SAT, or I think it's a 29 ACT. It's a 30, uh, 30, 30, 30, 30, okay, it was 20, uh, 30, uh, 1360 SAT, 30 ACT, um, and you need a minimum of a three five in all science and non-science coursework or three or higher. And you have to have completed five out of the eight required science courses. Cool, thank you. Um, so we are getting a bunch of programs about early assurance. Um, so next question is from Dia. Um, so she wants to know is what's the percentage of students who apply to early assurance um, are accepted? Um, how many students of those are accepted into um, SUNY Upstate? And if a student fails to get a score of a 5, 10 or above on the MCAT, but completes all other requirements, do they still have a chance to get into the program? Well, the number of people applying varies from one year to the next. Um, we typically have um, 10 to 12 people apply to the uh, Upstate Early Assurance. Um, that's in a, in a typical year. We, uh, two or three years ago, we actually had 24 people apply, which was quite unusual that we never, um, in the duration of the program, we've never had that many people apply. Um, so that that's, was kind of an aberration. It's usually, it's usually 10 to 12. Um, probably about a third of that group will get in. Um, so three or four out of, the, out of the 10 to 12. Some years it might be a little more, but it's usually at least, at least three to four. Usually at least 30% of the group would get in. Um, and the other part to the question of oh, the 510, well, they give you two chances to take the test um, to score the 510. So um, typically that's, that's the last step to getting in. Uh, and if you, you know, you, you uh, have to clear that threshold. And also you have to maintain, if you are admitted as a sophomore, you have to maintain your GPA levels throughout the remaining two years. Thank you. Um, so in relation to that, uh, that's actually for the peer advisor. So what kind of advice can you give to like um, intended pre-health or pre-med students in adjusting to college for freshman year to keep a competitive GPA? And uh, what general advice would you have given yourself uh, if you could go back in time? Um, for me, I would say in order to maintain a competitive GPA, I would make sure not to overload on your science and math classes uh, your first semester. Uh, you definitely need to make sure you have time to adjust to college. So make sure you take some of your gen eds your first semester, like maybe your G or your P gen ed. Uh, and then just take, uh, definitely take chem your first semester and maybe a bio class. But if you find yourself being very overwhelmed, remember you have three or if you're planning on taking gap year, four years to spread out some of those prerequisite classes. I agree. A balanced schedule is always better and you are able to take a few of your gen eds along with your intro science courses and that is always best um, your first year as you're adjusting and maybe find an activity that you enjoyed doing with friends like i joined the orchestra and that was my one extracurricular that um, i put my effort towards besides academics that really helped me stay well balanced also make sure you take advantage of the free opportunities at the school, like there is free tutoring for basically all of the pre-medical prerequisites, uh, like chemistry and organic chemistry and bio. Uh, and also many of the teachers hold office hours that are small group office hours. So definitely take advantage of uh, what's there for you. Great, thank you. Um, so for the advisors, um, are there any talks about adding different early assurance programs for other fields, um, such as PA? And um, in relation to PA2, uh, a student wants to know what's the acceptance rate for PA school on that Binghamton. Okay, right now we haven't, uh, the early assurance programs that were displayed on the side, on the side were, are the only ones that we have. And I haven't been approached, or to my knowledge, the university hasn't been approached um, 
for um, any um, early assurance program uh, related to physician assistant. Um, so I, I, at least right now, the ones that are, are listed on the slides are the only ones that have been approved um, for us to participate in. And um, the, the other, the acceptance rate for physician assistant, um, that's, um, it, that's a little hard to gauge also because a, a lot of the physician assistant students apply uh, they take one or two gap years because there's a fairly steep clinical hour requirement for physician assistant school. And oftentimes a student um, graduating from Binghamton will have the academic coursework taken care of, but they won't necessarily have all the clinical hours they need for, for various programs. And, and so you, you know, someone who would then graduate and not be around the university, you uh, kind of lose track of. And I know Andrew is signed back in or Andrew is on here so uh, he could provide some other information uh, maybe about his journey. Sure so so yeah I'm the president of the pre-PA organization on campus. Um, we've definitely seen a large amount of growth over the last few years um, since I started it as a, or joined it as a freshman um, but as as seniors not to, okay so you can either apply at the end of your junior year or at the end of your senior year. Um, CASPA opens up towards the end of April um, so it's different than like most application processes. Um, we usually see about five to 10 apply each year. But again, like Dr. Langhorn was saying, um, most people apply after because you do need those patient care experience hours. And with all of the coursework and just maintaining good, a, a good um, life work balance at school, it isn't super easy to get those hours. There are opportunities in Bingham, uh, in the Binghamton area, like at Lourdes Hospital where I work and a ton of other um, of our eboard members work. Um, but again, it does take time to get those hours, like, and you can't do everything during the summer um, and the winter. So it definitely takes time. A lot of students choose to uh, take a gap year. And again, that's the norm for uh, pre-physician assistant. Um, if you have more questions about that, um, I'll link my email down below and you guys can email me if you have specific questions about PA, because I've heard a lot of them. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Um, so for the pre health advisor, so, uh, if I'm taking AP credit right now in high school, um, how does that um, translate to once I get to Binghamton? So depending on the exam score you get on the AP credit, if you get a four or a five on an AP chem or an AP bio, you could either get out a part of your bio, part of your chem, or all of your bio, or all of your chem. Um, so then you would kind of go on to the next level of, of chemistry. You might go on to organic chemistry. You might go on to a second level, bio, second level biology course. So it depends on what your scores are. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I know we talked a lot about like traditional students um, coming to Binghamton and applying for a, uh, a medical field or looking into again to like, pre-health in a way. Um, so how about for like EOP students? Um, do they still have a chance of getting to early assurance programs with SUNY Upstate or any of the other um, early assurance partnerships we have? Uh, yes, they would. It's, uh, you know, they just have to meet the stipulated requirements for the programs. They're a little more um, um, rigorous than applying as a regular applicant because of the benefits that are derivative from them. But they don't, you know, anyone can apply that has the um, threshold values for the prerequisites. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And um, if I apply and am accepted to an early assurance program, and I wanted to, um, to go study abroad in a different country, um, would me uh, going away for either um, sometime this semester or during the summer session uh, affect early assurance? Studying abroad while you're on the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, you're with the study abroad. Uh, well, that, that's actually fairly easy to do if you're early assurance, um, because uh, with the exception of needing to take the MCAT or the DAT or the respective test, you, um, you don't have to participate in the regular application process. So one of the things that is uh, relatively easier to do is to study abroad. I can add to that as well. Um, myself and uh, Matt Trotta here on the call, um, we're not 
early assurance, but we both studied abroad. Uh, we did summer study abroad programs. Um, so sometimes uh, we found that for us that it was easier to study abroad in the summer. Um, if, cause there's quite a bit of course load, but we still got some time in to study abroad. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Thank you. We typically recommend that pre-health students do try to study abroad in the summer. Um, it's not to say that they cannot do that during the fall or the spring semester, but it requires a little bit more advanced planning. Um, and so summer is a good time to do it. Um, not to say that you can't do it during the fall or the spring, just that we have to begin the planning very early uh, to make sure you're getting all the prerequisite coursework that you need um, either before or after you go abroad. Cool. And um, to follow up with that, and especially with uh, prerequisites and gen eds, um, if I'm a biology major, what kind of classes would you recommend I, I take during my first semester? Um, would I have to take like music class or anything like that? Typically what we recommend for first semester students is to do no more than two math or science courses. And so for a pre-health student, that's usually going to be an intro level bio and an intro level chemistry course. Um, only the chemistry is really required during your first year though, because you need to do intro chemistry one and two, and then sophomore year you would do organic chemistry one and two. And so that's a big sequence that you need to be sure to fit in. Um, and so in addition to intro level bio and intro level chemistry during your first semester, you could do a gen ed and then maybe an additional gen ed or a writing course or a composition course that you may need um, for your Harper College writing requirement. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, so I know we've been answering a lot of different questions for our first year students. Um, so this one's actually a, a transfer student ask. Um, if transfer students are coming in from somewhere else, um, can they join the pre-health and rising track and what does that look like for them? You can as a transfer student, you could do the pre-health track for sure. Um, you'll just have to work with your advisor more closely to figure out what you have, what you need, um, and the pathway for you because if you don't have any sciences, we'll need to kind of catch up on your sciences. If you have some but not all, we'll kind of need to figure out, you know, how to get everything in the timely fashion. Um, especially if you're going to be taking the MCAT and you've got to have everything done by the end of your junior year. Um, or if you're taking a gap year, how is this going to look for you? And so we'll just work closely with you to get that done. Great, thank you. Um, so a question I just saw before, um, so do I actually need to be in the pre-health or pre-med track to apply to medical school? Well, you have to be in the track more or less. You have to take the required coursework, which is what the track is, you know, it was pointed out initially, it was a, uh, it's an advising track or advising program. It's separate from what your major is, but you do have to be in the track to line the coursework up and, um, and finish it and to be able to take the MCAT and then ultimately uh, to apply. Uh, so I, I um, you know, that you, you, you know, you can't apply without the stated requirements and without the test. Thank you. Um, so for the peer advisors, um, if you remember, um, typically how big are the pre-med classes? And do you know how classes are graded? Is it purely on exams? Uh, do we have homework? Uh, is lab part of it? You know, what, what's that like? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, you can jump into, but um, to answer that, I would say, you have a little bit of all that you mentioned. You have exams, you also have labs and homework, all of the above, and that's all built into your grade. I'd say your intro level classes are probably larger. Intro chem and intro bio per class, there's, there's different classes throughout the day, but probably typically 250 students in a lecture hall, I would say. And then as you get further along your career and your upper level classes, they tend to get a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And the courses have also changed since we took them, um, and they're moving towards more uh, small lab activities. So you may be in a, a general bio class where there's 450 people, but your uh, lab course is going to only be a smaller class, and it's going to be uh, based on developing research skills. So uh, your lecture classes are going to be more based on things like quizzes, exams, uh, homework assignments, and your labs are going to be uh, based more on writing and quizzes. So it, it depends on which uh, prerequisite class. 
Thank you. Um, so for the advisors, um, I know pre-health is such a, a general term. Um, typically, what are the most majors under the pre-health track? Um, I think that most students tend to major in integrative neuroscience and biology. Uh, some students major in psychology, chemistry, or biochemistry, um, but I definitely think the most students are integrative neuroscience and biology. And uh, to follow up with that, um, if I am a psych or integrative neuroscience major, um, is it very math and science heavy for the coursework and course load? Um, I would say for, I know for integrative neuroscience, it's very science heavy. The only math courses I had to take were psych stats, and that was basic math. It wasn't math heavy, but Calc 1, Calculus 1 is required for uh, being pre-med. And even if you're a psychology major, you're still going to have to take the pre-med or pre-health prerequisites for whichever school you're applying to. So while the psychology major may not be super like basic math and science heavy, you're still going to have to take general chemistry, organic chemistry, and calculus, and whatever else is required for your pre-health school, uh, even if it's not a part of the major. Great, thank you. Um, so the next one is about medical school requirements. Um, so typically for all med schools, um, are the requirements the same or do they vary depending on where you're applying to? So for med school schools specifically, the, the requirements are pretty much all the same. You're looking at intro to bio, intro to chem, organic chemistry one and two, physics one and two, calculus, statistics, psych, and so on. Um, for the other programs, the secondary programs like PA, PT, um, farm, um, OT, their requirements are going to differ a little bit here and there. Um, a great website that we have on BU is the pre-health website. You can actually go on to that and look up the different types of um, different types of options underneath pre-health, like I just mentioned, OT, PT, med, dental, and look at the requirements. Um, there's usually one list of what every school is looking for, and then there's sometimes a secondary list of what some schools are looking for. So in other words, all schools want X, Y, and Z. Some schools might want A, B, and C, and therefore you've got to do your own research and look up what the schools you're looking to apply might be looking at as secondary prerequisites. Great, thank you. Um, so a question just came in and students wanted to know, um, is it difficult to double major um, while also being a pre-health or pre-med track? Um, you can. Go right ahead, Leah. I'm sorry. Um, I think it depends really how many credits you're coming in with and what the majors are. So if you want to do something like uh, bio and psych and pre-med, there's a lot of overlap with the actual prerequisite courses, so that might be a little more doable. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have to take a lot of overload semesters, I think. Thank you. Um, another question just came in, and this is actually for uh, majors that are not under Harper College. So if I'm a biomedical engineer major, and am I in the pre-health track with Watson or with Harper College? That's a good question. You're actually on the pre-health track with Harper. So you would see your engineering advisor for your major coursework, and you would also see your pre-health advisor your freshman year and sophomore year for your pre-health requirements, and then you would see Dr. Langhorn your junior year and senior year for your additional later on pre prerequisites and things like that. Thank you. Um, so I think it might have been answered before, but um, a student asked about transferring. So um, if I haven't taken a lot of science courses um, in my first uh, college or university, um, what, how does a pre-health advisor kind of help you um, decide what class you need to take? Again, we, we would just be looking at the exact prerequisites that you might need, depending on which health graduate program you wanted to get into and kind of working backwards from there to see how we could fit those courses into your schedule uh, moving forward. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining me today and thanks everyone for supporting this webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you.